Hello, my name is Stephen Miller. I'm a math professor at Williams College, and I'm honored to be last year's recipient of the CUR Goldwater Scholars Faculty Mentor Award. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the wonderful opportunity I've had to work with so many bright young scholars, as well as so many wonderful colleagues of mine. Talk a little bit about what undergraduate research is like, what it has meant to my students and to myself, and give you a little bit of a sense of the types of problems we look at, including some of them. So I want to use expanding circles as a nice way to describe you know, just exactly how many people I need to thank for what is happening today. So the first, of course, are the Goldwater Scholars, the people I've worked with who won a Goldwater Award after working with me. But this is merely a small subset. There's over 400 other students, high school students, college students, who have worked with the students and myself, and who helped create the atmosphere where these results were done. And then, of course, there's all my faculty colleagues, especially those at Williams in Michigan, who helped create the environment where this research could continue. And then there's the people in the fellowship office, especially at Williams, Lynn, Chick, and Capture King, who helped our students find opportunities like the Goldwater and others. And then finally, there's the programs that they go to afterwards, the NSF, Graduate School, Industry, Churchill. And again, this is only a very small subset. This doesn't include all of my advisors, my family, and all that. But I want to just give a little bit of a sense of just you know, how honored I am to be chosen as the representative of such a large sustained effort by so many of the so many guests. So I want to talk just briefly about some of the joys of undergraduate research. The first is that it opens up students to possibilities. It's very different than taking a standard class where you know exactly what to do. If section 3.4 is on the chain rule, it's a pretty good guess that the chain rule will play a key role in doing the homework problems. You're here, it's a lot more creative, a lot more freedom in terms of what to do, a lot more productive. The next is you build up valuable skills for all walks of life. Even if you don't become an academic, you are still going to be giving talks, unless of course you become a professional line, you'll be writing papers, you'll be reading technical things, and the skills you build here are highly transferable. Another, of course, is that a rising tide lifts all boats. And so while you know, many of my students have been fortunate enough to win a gold water, because the competition is so fierce, even those who don't still benefit from the environment that this helps create. One thing I'm particularly proud of is that so many of my students, especially so many of my Goldwater scholars, pay it forward and are heavily involved in math outreach activities, the math corps at the University of Michigan, to going with me to elementary schools all over the place, and to doing continuing education lectures for teachers at programs like Teachers for Scholars in Boston. And finally, as we marked earlier, this is a wonderful springboard to the future. So after you know, winning at Goldwater, many of my students go on and win Churchill's or NSF's and pursue your wonderful careers in academia or industry. So I want to just quickly give a little bit of a sense of the types of problems we can do. And you know, again, the challenge here is to choose a topic which can be described in you know, less than two or three minutes and still give a feel of the creativity. And so I thought a beautiful one is a question of irrationality. So we say a number is irrational if we can't write it as the ratio of two integers. And an old problem, one of the, in fact, passive, rites of passage to become a mathematician is to prove that the square root of two is irrational. And I'm going to quickly give a geometric proof, an ingenious one, due to Stanley Tenenbaum. He said, imagine the square root of two is not irrational. So we can write the square root of two as a over b, or two as a squared over b squared. And what we'll do is we'll assume that a and b is the smallest pair where this is true. So we form a, a square of side length a, and we form two smaller squares on the corners of side length b. And if you look then, b squared is just the area of the two big red squares. a squared is the area of the whole thing, so 2b squared equals a squared. This pink area is double counted by the two red triangles. These two white areas are not, and therefore this pink area has to equal the sum of these two. Well, when the dust settles, you see that this gives you another representation of 2, two equals 2b minus a, the length of this side squared, divided by a minus b, the length of this side squared. And a minus b is less than b, so that this is truly small. So again, you should never really do too much algebra in public, and especially not quickly, but the idea is given one solution, we're able to find a smaller one. You can do this for other shapes, you can do this for other numbers. And so you can do the square root of three is irrational by looking at triangles and you see these three pink areas are each double counted, the white area is missed. And so I asked my students, how far can you push this? And one of my students, David Montague, was able to show that you can actually extend this to pentagons. And there is a beautiful proof of this or an illustration of this by the mathologer, which I'm going to show right now.
Now, something that's great about a problem is not only what you can do or what you do, but what comes next. And so I asked my students, how far can we push this? And I knew when I gave them this problem, there was going to be a difficulty. So the numbers that we can do using the triangle method, uh, we can do the square root of three, here's square root of six, you can do square root of 10. These are triangle numbers. So the n triangle number is the sum of the first n integers. So here's one, one plus two, one plus two plus three, and so on. But we knew the proof has to break down because the n triangle number is, is a nice formula. It's n times n plus one over two. And if you take n equals eight, you get eight times nine over two, which is 36, which is six squared. So we knew when we started this, that an obstruction would have to emerge. And the question is, where does this come from? And again, a good problem has future things to look at. Open right now is square root of seven and the cube root of two. And so I strongly encourage you to try to play with these. Although I will warn you that these are quite hard problems. I've had students who have played with these for over a year without you know, being able to push it further, but they've enjoyed the process, they've learned other things. And again, that's almost all you can ask for from a great problem. So again, you know, thank you very much for this honor. I want to thank all of these students and colleagues and support staff who have worked with me over the years. And since this is the pre-recorded beta test version, I'm going to actually do one additional bit of mathematics to give a little bit more of a flavor of the types of problems one can look at. So I want to talk briefly about a game that I created a few years ago using the Fibonacci numbers. So the Fibonacci numbers, you know, one, two, three, five, eight, are defined so that each number is the sum of the previous two. So eight is five plus three, 13 is eight plus five. And I'm defining them as one, two, three, and not zero, one, one, because of a beautiful theorem due to Zeckendorf that every integer has a unique representation as a sum of non-consecutive Fibonacci numbers. And the nice way to prove this is the greedy algorithm. Take a number, subtract the largest Fibonacci number less than or equal to, look at what's left over, subtract the largest Fibonacci number less than or equal to. If those were adjacent, you could have subtracted their sum. So I'll let you, you know, fill in the details. So for example, if we take 2021, chosen not randomly, the largest one we could take off is 1597, then 377, then 34, and 13. So what kind of game can we create on this? Well, we're going to create a two-player game. You're going to alternate turns, and the last person to move wins. And so the bins are going to be the Fibonacci numbers, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8. And we're going to start with a positive integer n, with n pieces on the first bin and everything else empty. And then a turn is going to be one of two moves. If you have two pieces on the cape bin, you can remove and put a bin at fk plus one and one at fk minus two. So if I had two things at eight, that would be at 16. And I can replace 16 with 13 plus three. If I had two at five, that would be a 10. I can replace it with an eight and a two. The other possible move is if I have two adjacent bins that are occupied, I can take one off each one and place it up next. So if I have a three and a five, I can make an eight. If I have a 13 and a 21, I can make a 34. So for example, if we start off with n equals 10, then we have to have you know, 10 pieces at the first bin. And the only possible opening move is to take two of these and put, move them and have eight here and then one in the second bin. You know, a little bit later in the game, if we have a configuration like this, more moves are available. I can take the two ones that I have at the second Fibonacci number and replace it with three and a one. Or I could take something at the one and the two and remove them and replace that with three. And so one of my students was able to prove in her senior thesis at Williams that there is a winning strategy. As long as n is greater than two, player two always has a winning strategy, but it is a non-constructive proof, which is absolutely amazing. So you can tell that player two has a way to win if they play intelligently, but we don't know what that is. And this has been extended to other sequences, to uh, multiple player games. There's a lot of questions one can ask. And the one I would love to know is, can you find the winning strategy? So again, thank you very much. Have a great day.